Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Roger Edison. For uh, we're we're friends, so I'll just call you Roger. And and uh, we, so welcome to the Training Master Series. Thank you. Good to be with you. You bet. You bet. You've been doing okay with the uh, pandemic and everything. I've been doing okay. This is my third month uh, staying in the house. Uh, I go out. I go out once a week to buy groceries, but that's about it. It is our honor to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, normally we'll start with the uh, with, with the uh, training masters. Is, is that uh, to, to, can you tell a little bit about yourself and where is your hometown? Where did you grow up? And something like uh, also, where did you go to college? Was your major? And how many years you have been in this industry? Okay. Uh, well, my as you said, my name is Roger Addison. Uh, I live in South Salito. California, which is just north of San Francisco. If you go across the Golden Gate Bridge, the first town you come to is Sausalito. Uh, I've been here for about, I lived here for about, uh, oh, maybe 20 years. Uh, I lived in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, since I graduated from college, and that was in, for my doctorate, was in uh, 1979. And I graduated from a college by the name of Baylor University which is in Waco, Texas, and my degree was in psychology. And so some people ask me, how did I get from psychology to performance improvement? Well, most of the people that I grew up with were psychologists, and I actually started working with a group of psychologists in probably in the early, well, probably, yeah, early 60s, uh, and they were pioneers in the performance improvement. Now, it wasn't called that. It wasn't called anything. <laughs> it's just right. what we did. It's just what we did. But I worked for a group of psychologists, and they uh, had some special projects around the world, and mainly in the United States. So that's how so I you have been. In, yeah. So you have been in this industry by rough count f over forty years. Uh, way, yes, way over forty years. Right. Yeah. Some <laughs> of that was when I was in college too, but because I, you know, in the meantime. It took me about 10 years to get my degree, uh, my master's and my doctorate. So that took some time out of doing any type of working experience. But mainly, yes. You bet, you bet. That's a very long career. And uh, everybody's here on this side of the Pacific Pound is uh, looking up to it. You're one of the models that we're, we're looking up to in this industry right now. You know that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's, it's hard for me to sometimes think that I'm a model. <laughs> but actually, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a funny story. Is that one of my professors in college won a, uh, an award called the, the, um, the Model Teacher of the Year. And uh, so he said, well, you know, that sounds, you know, that sounds good. Then he said, I wonder what the word model actually means. So he goes, <laughs> he, looks at, he looks it up and he says, an imitation of the real thing. So I'm basically an imitation of the real thing. <laughs> so I think that's always been funny about what models are. When we say the word model translated into English is model, but um, in Chinese is more kind of excellent, you know, or, or excellent or standard or oh, oh, way beyond the standard, something like that. That's way, why we call it model. But there's a little cultural differences. In yeah, I think, that, well, I think that makes more sense because that's what people usually think that a master performer is somebody, an excellent performer. So I think- You bet, you right, bet. Right. So how, so how did you, uh, when did you start to, to get into performance improvement and how, under what occasion? And somebody just come knock on the door and tell you that, Roger, you should be in PI or? Well, it's so, not, not exactly. Uh, when, I was in, uh, when I was in high school, they were a group of psychologists were looking for somebody were looking for students to basically test programmed instruction and uh, so i said well that was a good you know it was a good little easy job that i could do after school and they'd pay me for it so i thought that was a good idea so then i just started hanging around these people <laughs> basically and uh got to know and said you know this really looks like an interesting field so they basically hired me uh, to work in one of their what they call learning labs, and I did that. I did that for several years. But meanwhile, I said I probably need to go get some education, 
And uh, so that's when I went back to uh, school and started working on my undergraduate work, then my graduate work at Baylor University. And that was, and then I graduated, like I said, in 1979. Mm -hmm. And I, get, I moved to California. Before that, I lived in New Mexico and Texas. But before that, then I decided to move here because there were more opportunities uh, here in California. So I moved here to California and worked for a private organization as a, as a consultant for about uh, three years before I actually went over to uh, a bank called Wells Fargo Bank. And that's, oh, probably, yeah. and that's probably when I started you know, really practicing uh, the science and the art of performance improvement with a large organization. And we were actually, I was actually hired to, do, now again, it wasn't called that, but I was hired to come in as looking for performance issues in the organization other than training problems. You bet. So it was not, was not some, so actually I didn't work for the training group. I worked for a, a group that was started around performance improvement. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you, uh, so you just mentioned that you, uh, somebody asked you to, uh, to test a programmed instruction and right. what, in what year it was that like in the seventies or sixties, because 60s. programmed instruction was sixties. In the 1960s. Yes. That's right. I was in high school. And so that's, that was like you know way before anybody was doing anything like program instruction, and those were the, actually the prototypes for right. what, we call, what we call online learning today. Uh, right, you would see that today. So, so that's how really it got started back way before. Uh, and these, all these people that I worked with were students of B.F. Skinner, and uh, who basically laid the foundation for uh, performance improvement, or not performance, but uh, well, performance improvement as well as program instruction. So, do you think uh, that uh, the program instruction, uh, the program instruction in the in the sixties, really laid a good foundation for today's e-learning or technology-enabled learning? Yeah, I do, and I and I wish that I would see the online learning go back to some of their roots and see some of the research that was done early, because mm -hmm. uh, I don't personally, I don't think online learning today is as good as it should be. And uh, if you look at now what's happening uh, in since a lot, of the, a lot of the students around the world are now doing online education, it's really, it's really not working as well as it could. And because the, the technology, uh, and I'm, when I say technology, I'm talking about the computer technology uh, is not that great. But the technology of instruction, which is, is basically lacking also, that's my opinion. You bet. So that's a that's a that's something new that I never heard from you. That about uh, e-learning. Uh, why do you think? Why don't you think, Roger, that e-learning uh, isn't as, uh, as good as it should be today? Well, I I, um, I think that what they've done is taken some of the principles of classroom instruction and tried to put it online, and I it, it just, in my opinion, it just doesn't work. That well, and then also I'll, I'll tell you frankly, is that when you go into any type of, of um, e-learning or webinars, anything like that, I have I have never, and I mean I'm talking about never, had a good connection, or it's always something going wrong with the technology on the other end, and I always find that very very frustrating. I was actually again I was at the awards ceremony the other day right. at SBI. And yes. I'm sitting there and you know listening to Allison Rossett, who was a wonderful presenter. You know, right. all at once the system would go down for no reason that I could figure out. So you'd wait, and then it would come back on, and then she would start again. And so I'm not saying that always happens, but it happens enough that it basically is very disrupting to the learning process. I think. Uh, so, it, so it is not, but based on what you just said, it's not only on the, on the tangible technology side, but it's also the classroom instructional technology side. Is, it, is that true? Right. I just don't, well, there are exceptions to that, I understand. But generally speaking, that uh, a webinar has to have a lot of good sound instructional background in order for it to be good. And that takes, that takes a lot of uh, energy to, to develop those lessons. 
develop those instructions online. Again, I, that's not my expertise. So uh, I'm just saying what, what things that I have observed over the years of looking at performance or, or, or programmed instruction and as well as online learning. You bet, you bet. But, but, but what you said is, is you're not alone. A lot of people that I've interviewed, I've, you know, I've, so far, you know, I've, I have uh, Elaine and Roger Addis, I mean, excuse me, uh, Roger Kaufman and Bob Pike the other day, and also uh, Jim. So they all said that, um, uh, all mentioned, especially Bob Pike, Bob said, uh, because he's doing a lot of, uh, you know, instruction, uh, classroom instruction, now he's converting a lot of his, his uh, face-to-face instructional-led, ILT, instructional-led uh, uh, training to online. And he said it's not just like the old days, it should not be the page turner. You know, you electrify all the training materials and now, and then you call it your fabulous e-learning. It's, it's, it's not like that. Well, <laughs> it's I, I, I know, and that, that's what the problem is. They've tried to put page turning into lectures. And again, this is not the, the format that we're using here is okay because it's a conversation and interview. But, you know, people just sit there in front of their screens and just lecture, lecture, lecture. And you have no idea uh, what the interaction is uh, with the students. And I think that's a real downside of, of uh, people putting these things online. You and bet, think, you bet. You bet, you bet. So, um, so that's um, so. You have been. If you if you were asked for the pro, for testing for the program of the instruction, and then so you started in the seventies when you were doing pursuing your your PhD, right. and you I, I probably I figured out you probably spent a lot of years writing your dissertations, and then mm -hmm. in the eighties and nineties, and 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 after the millennium, and then uh, now you know after millennium already 10, 20 years of uh 20 years so before the millennium and uh, what do you see how you know human performance techno technology or hpt or performance improvement evolved was it different how, how was it like in the 70s well, 80s or 90s or something like uh, that you know i i, um, I always call it performance improvement rather than hpt because i HPT. think mm -hmm. hpt uh, human performance technology always was a hard term for people to understand. And in particular, when you got to the word technology, uh, it, that was one, that's something that doesn't, everybody thinks about machinery. And human performance technology has, no, has really nothing to do with machinery. If you actually look up the word technology, technology is applied science. And so, that, and so to me, performance improvement is applied science. To, uh, to people, to processes, and to the organization. And that's what, how I've always looked at a performance improvement. In the 19, when I graduated, as I mentioned, in, from college in the 1970s, is that uh, there wasn't much uh, information around, around performance. There was a few books, there were, you had to go, you had to go to ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement, uh, to find out anything about what the field was doing. At that time was an ISPI, if I'm correct. At that time it was actually the first, when I first, my first meeting I ever attended, it was called the National Society for Programmed Instruction. Instruction, yes, yes. So over the years it's changed uh, to performance improvement. And to me it makes more sense to call it performance improvement. Uh, and so that's, that's what I've always practiced performance improvement. But one of the changes that um, when I came to California, the uh, group of psychologists, again, another group of psychologists I worked with, they sent me to a Gary Rumler workshop. And that was in the early, uh, late, well, it was early 80s. It was maybe around, maybe the latter part of 1970. And so there's where I started getting some more formalized uh, models and tools and resources around performance improve, improvement to work in industry. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, was the, the, probably some of the major points. And then, like I said, in 1983 is when I went to work for Wells Fargo for an organization that, or for a woman who said, I want you, to, I want you guys to come in. And she didn't, she, I want you to be consultants. She didn't call it performance consultants. But I want you to be consultants and look at other things happening in the bank 
other than um, training issues or training solutions. And that's what we, that's when we started, really started looking at the whole issues around what are causing some of the performance problems or issues in organizations rather than just training, because the people were fine. It was some of the th systems that were getting in the way of them performing correctly. Was that in the, in the 90s or 80s? 80s, 1983. That's what I was right. when I worked for Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. And then for uh, 17 years after that, is that I went from, from working, being hired, and eventually I started running the department, performance improvement department. It wasn't called that, but that's what we did. What was called then? It was, um, it was called Stack Development and Resources. Got it. I can't remember exactly what it was called. We, we never sure. called it that, but I mean, I think it said, I think it said, well, that's what it said on the organizational chart. Right, right. Because I was assuming probably it was called the personnel or something because those are, well, the popular names at that, that time. It, it was I was the, just assuming. Now, uh, it started in the uh, personnel department, but uh, human, and then turned into human resources. But then, uh, Eventually, I went to work for a, a line organization. Mm -hmm. So it came out of the personnel or the uh, resource, uh, human resources area, and into the line, which was a major shift on the work that I started doing because I was closer to actually what was happening in the organization on the line. A, a line organization, what, what do you mean? Uh, uh, well, uh, okay. Uh, in, 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 um, I don't know, I'm not sure. Well, you're probably structured the same way. You have people, staff people, like training, human resources, uh, uh, marketing. Those are staff positions. Line positions are those people who have actually interact with the customer. Got so, it. I got it. So I thought it's the name of a company. No, 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 no. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. Just, the line workers or the, the line, line staff. Right. Yeah. Right. Got it. So, People, people actually doing people actually doing work that make a difference for their customers. Yes, got it. So, what do you see? Uh, what happened in uh, at ISPI and ISPI in the nineteen eighties was called an ISPI, and then uh, probably in the 90, 95 was called, changed to ISPI. What's the occasion? Why was it changed to well, ISPI, and what what was okay. what's the development? I think what you started seeing is that a lot of the performance issues were not, were not training issues. You bet. And so programmed instruction was sort of, it was, it was more of a historical framework. Then it became uh, a more a learning aspect of it. But then they even found out, you know, we're not solving all the problems or the issues in organizations if we limit ourselves to just looking at instruction. And one of the names, one of the names of ISBI was also called, it was called performance and instruction. So they got rid of the word instruction and just went to performance improvement. Um, along the way, the, the journals and all that, uh, all the historical work were always called performance improvement. So it just kind of, we just dropped the name of instruction along the way, because too many of us were just figuring out that this just is not solving the the big issues of organizations. And then right. you also then start seeing uh, people like Tom Gilbert and Gary Rumler and Don Toasty and Roger Kaufman and Alison Rossett started writing about some of these uh, issues in the organizations and not and seeing there are other models we should be using. You know, uh, Margot Murray comes up with her whole work around mentoring. Coaching. So, right. Coaching. You know, so there became a lot of other interventions besides just uh, learning interventions that you we were looking at. And then you start seeing that learning interventions probably had not much to do in, the, in reality with what somebody was actually trained to do their job. And then something came along where they were not as productive. There was something else usually in the organization that was going on that we had to figure out what it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you just mentioned twice that um, uh, in, 
in your uh, in in your answer just now, in your talk just now, you mentioned twice that training is not the only issue. And uh, I know that right now you've done a lot of uh, consulting projects. Is, 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 first of all, is that all you do, consulting projects right now? Right now, that's all I do is consulting, right? Okay. And so you have seen a lot of organizations. You, you probably is one of the, um, I'm assuming that one of the conclusions that, that you are, t tell us more about it. Training is now the solution because we got, uh, you know, millions of viewers in China and other developing countries. So I th tell us know, about it. I th you know, I've, I've worked in, I've worked in many, 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 many countries and many developing countries. And I do understand that when people are first coming into the business world or the uh, working for their living, they need to be, they need the acquisition of skills and knowledge. They need the skills and knowledge to do their work. So I'm not, I'm not negating, I'm not saying that's not the right thing to do. But once somebody has the skills and knowledge and actually doing the work, and then you see the productivity or the worker not performing at the level that we think they should, it's probably not the performer who having the problem. It's probably something in the system that's getting in the way that he or she is not doing their best to work. So what I just found out is when I come in, they say, well, can you come in and give us a training course? And I'll say, well, what tell me some of the things that are, that are happening? They say, well, we're just not getting the productivity out of the people that we should. Then you say, what, what, did they go to class? Oh, yeah, they went to class. Did they do well in class? Oh, yeah, they, they did well in class, but now they're on the job and they can't perform as well as they should have. Well, that tells me something about maybe the training, that the training was not as, I don't want to say as good as it should have been to transfer to the job. And so yeah. that's the one, that's the things I see. So that's, that's how, uh, that's how I work mainly. And I'll, I'll give you a little example. You bet. Um, the, um, we were, um, we were called in to, um, and, and there's important, uh, some important words I'm going to tell you about when I tell you the story. The, we were called in uh, to do some retraining of a group of, of, of workers who uh, basically were at a computer center and a call center like. Yep. And what had happened is that they moved the call center to a new location. Okay. So mm -hmm. they said, and then after they moved them to a new location, productivity went way down. So they said, what we'd like to do is come in and retrain all of our people. Mm -hmm. And that, so I said, well, can I come out and look and see what's going on? and ask you a few questions before we go out and retrain all these people. Because training is a very, very expensive uh, in any organization. It's probably one of the most expensive things you can do. Very expensive in your view. Right. So what I went in there and found out two things. I said it wasn't happening to every shift. There was a morning shift, there was an afternoon shift, and there was an evening shift. So three yep. different. So in the morning, everything was fine. All the people were at their productivity level was just fine. And the evening shift, all of those people were just fine. So I thought, well, first of all, we shouldn't train everybody if they're already doing it. Why train everybody? So I said, well, what's happening in the afternoon that's not happening in the morning or the evening? So we sent out a group of people just to look around. And what had right. happened is that the, I told you these people are on big computer screens. And in the afternoon, uh, because of the lighting conditions, there was a lot of glare on the computer screens. So they were just making a lot of mistakes because they couldn't see the computer, the screens accurately. And nobody thought about, well, maybe we should just put up some curtains or maybe we should just put some shields over the screens or something like that in order for the productivity. That was our recommendation. And guess what happened? Productivity, went, right, productivity went up. So there was no training involved. What we did is we changed the environment. So I would say it's one of those early days in the 30s, maybe the Hawthorne effect, Hawthorne effect, right? Well, it wasn't exactly the Hawthorne effect, but yeah. But, but it, something but similar, I, they I, found I, out. I know, what you're, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes the environment basically 
we change the environment and productivity goes down, you say, oh, well, maybe we should retrain those people. And the answer is probably not. If somebody is doing their job. Right. And now they're not doing their job. There's probably something else going on. And that's what I'm suggesting that we probably go take a look and do some observation and ask some questions and uh, find out actually what's going on here. That's an excellent example. It is, even though it, is sounds, it sounds very simple, but it's very crucial. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it means money. I mean, it means business. I mean, the business, uh, it also means results. Right. I think that's a very vivid example, even though it, is, it sounds small, but in real world it's not. Because what you gave us is, uh, even though it's a small, uh, maybe there are many, uh, I mean, there are other factors that in, are in the way of the performance results. And you just gave us one example, one factor that is lighting in the, in the environmental. Maybe there are process, there are like tools, there are like management styles and, and, and team atmosphere or something like that. Well, you, Keep morale. I think you, you see. I think what you're doing is you're you're listing all the other alternative inter, interventions or solutions to performance problems, and rarely do we see that after somebody is doing the work and been trained that it's going to be not not more training, unless it's a new job. I'm not suggesting it's a new not a new job, or right. or sometimes organizations have what we call compliance training. And that is something that maybe the federal government says we had to have training around uh, safety procedures, right? And things like that. Now that those are, those are things that are that we just do, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about doing your job is a total different thing. So I'm saying if you've got good, you know, if you put good instruction together and people can do their job and transfer back to their job, then we have something that is useful and now and now we look back at the job and see what's happening when you do your consulting projects on a daily basis and uh, you do you, you work with a training department for most of the cases under most of the cases right it, it, it well it can be training departments it can be marketing departments it can be right uh, uh, like uh, online right departments. it can be lots of different things so it just you bet. Who brings you in? So that's the, that's the thing is that who brings you into the organization? Right. Because a lot of viewers, there are, there are, there are millions, <laughs> there, there are a lot of them and then they're in the learning development industry. So um, as I, I'm, I'm sure that you have worked with a lot of training department folks and in your, in your client organizations and, and you probably seen, seen them struggling. You know, you probably seen them struggling. What's the, what's the value of training? What's the problem? Why can't I solve our business problems? Something like that. So what's your advice to them if you are facing like a lot of them and you know, the I, training function people? I think, I think what you, I try to show rather than tell. And I was working with a group of senior managers from a large insurance company. And uh, it was a, it was a learning and development organization. And I have a little, um, um, I don't want to say test, a little case study that I give people so they can kind mm-hmm. of discover whether or not training would make a difference to their own success. Right. I give, that, I give this little, uh, little discussion with them. And what they do is discover that it's not, training is not the issue. It's, and this goes back to Tom Gilbert, is that it's usually clear expectations that people don't have clear expectations of what they're supposed to do. They usually don't have the feedback of what they're trying to accomplish. They basically don't have the skills and not the skills, but they don't have the, the, the resources to do their job and they don't necessarily have the incentives to do their job. They discovered that on their own. And it's always amazed. These people were amazed that they did not choose that learning was going to be a solution to their performance issues in their own organization. Now, I could have told them that. And they would have said, well, you're just trying to sell a product. Right. And so I'm not trying, I don't have any products to sell. I, my product is improving performance. So that's, that's how I look at it. So I think telling people, you know that it isn't a training issue you got to show them or or work with them or have a discussion with them around 
performance, how performance improvement works and how it would be, uh, what would benefit to them and their organization. Like the, in the movie, uh, Jack McGuire, show uh, Tom Cruise, you know, show me the money. <laughs> show them the facts and numbers, right? Well, yeah, show me the research, show me the data, show me what's happening. So that I think goes back into the whole idea. Observation right. and, and uh, questioning people are one of our really skills that we should have as performance consultants. And mainly going in, uh, going in and looking, just observing what is happening in the organization. And you find out a lot of things that uh, is really quite interesting. And when they observe, they should really take a truly systematic view. Well, they should take not only a systematic view and a step-by-step -step view, but the authors should take a systemic systems view and seeing how all the other systems play together so the organization can, can work at their peak performance. That really comes to, uh, Roger, that really comes to... Um the RSVP, the famous and well-known, the one and only <laughs> RSVP. Because, you know, the reason I, I'm asking this question on behalf of me, myself, and our team, including my partner, um, Hui, you know, you, you know <laughs> Hui. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hui. Yeah, and we were good, good, good old friends. And uh, we have been teaching, we have been teaching our management GPS IE model for for hundreds of uh, workshops, each you know, each each one is runs for two days, lasts for two days, and every morning, every morning. I mean, the first morning we, we always teach RSVP, and of course, uh, just for the viewers, RSVP is the first four basic principles of the ten standards, and uh, and uh, Roger. Um, I know, we know that you came up with the word, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you came up with the word RSVP, the first four principles. Was that correct? And how did you come up with it and why? Let me, okay, let me go, I'll give you a little bit of story, another story about that. Please. Uh, there, when, when ISPI first started, there were a lot of people who had a lot of different models. And what we call it was, ISPI was model driven. So there was, uh, models from Gary Rummler. There were models from George Har Harless. There was models from uh, Don Toasty. So there were lots of different models. So what we decided to do is uh, we had we, we we called a summit of all these basically performance improvement consultants, trying to figure out what was common to all other models. And what we found out there were four things common to all their models. And the four things common, after I discussed it, the four things they all agreed on, that was common, was RSVP. They all focused on results. That was the R. The, and we, by the way, they didn't call it that way, but that's how I interpreted it. Then they said the S, they were all systems thinking or systemic thinking. That was the S. The, the uh, V was they added value, but also they measured. But they said, you know, how could we prove what we do? So we added value to the organization. And the third or the fourth one was P, is that they all had partners, partners either with their clients or other performance improvement professionals. So that became the, the basic standards or the basic principles of performance improvement. And then the other other six areas were dealt with more of instructional side. But I was more interested in what, what was the basic principles of all the models. So that's how RSVP. And so I just sort of put it together and it became out RSVP. <laughs> oh, thank you for doing that. You have done a great contribution to the industry, actually. And became the foundation, the basis of the fourth four. Uh, we call it the basic principles of, our, of the 10 standards. And I think if you think about it, is that if we always think about what results we're trying to achieve, what systems do we use to achieve those results? How do we measure and add value to those results? And then who do we work with in order to achieve those results? I mean, that's kind of what our SVP is all about. Why, tell us a little bit about why uh, RSVP comes from the, you know, in front of the other six approaches. Well, that, 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 I think I think because RSVP goes across all of the models, so no matter what model we're using, 
they all have RSVP as part of it. So I think the other thing is important. The other thing too, remember, there's one other thing too is that we also discovered when you do, when you look for RSVP, it was another model came out later. It was called RSVP Plus. And the plus, right. and the plus was that when you use it, you've got to be solution neutral and a solution appropriate. So that was a, just another little add-on to the RSVP. But again, RSVP goes across all models, instructional or non-instructional models. I think that's the why you see it comes first. You bet, you bet. So um, RSVP um, plus, uh, I just now says solution. Solution neutral. Neutral, right. Solution. Solution. Tell us a little bit about solution yeah. neutral. Okay, what, if you go in and do any type of analysis or any type of work in an organization and you have a solution in the back of your head, basically your observations and your questions will lead you to that solution. Ah. And so you, it, you've got to go in as best you can saying, I don't know what the solution to these issues are. So if you become solution neutral in your questions and your observations, then you can probably get an appropriate, what's appropriate for the organization. So I think that's, that's, what, uh, that's when you see uh, the RSVP and then going around, what is it solution neutral as well as solution appropriate. You bet. So solution neutral basically is uh, do not uh, to avoid any prejudgment or pre-assessment. I mean, uh, or any just assumptions, you know, uh, you avoid anything like uh, you have a conclusion before you go in even. Well, and again, when that came about is that when I, I told you when I worked for the bank, you'd have people come in and try you sell their product. Right. So I said, well, first of all, why don't you do a little analysis or find out actually what's going on. And they, oh, go, go that's a great idea. But every right. time they did that, guess what they, guess what always the solution was? The product Rainy? came in with trying to sell me. So I said, maybe there's something weird, maybe there's something strange about this whole thing about, maybe they weren't so solution neutral, they already had a product in mind. So they're asking the wrong questions. Yeah, yeah. It's a, there's a metaphor when you have hammers in hand, you, ha you see everywhere, you see nails are everywhere. And always <laughs> in the hammer always there was their product. Exactly, exactly. So uh, in, in our practice, we call the RSVP the basic principles among the 10, and then the, the, the other six because they're really systematic approaches. Is, is that fair to call them that uh, way? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, a, it's a systematic approach. Yes. Right. Again, there are lots of systematic approaches out there. And that just happens to be one of them. But again, you, in our work, we need to take a systematic approach to uh, coming up with performance improvement solutions. Well, mm -hmm. again, thank you for creating RSVP because uh, it's been there for how many years? Uh, when, when did you create the RSVP uh, specifically? W which year? It's been, I don't exactly, I can't remember exactly which year. There's a paper that was done on it. But again, uh, it was probably done in the 19... 90s probably 1990s yeah 1990s right so probably the middle probably the middle of 1990s just around the time when nispi became ispi something like that yeah uh, probably a little bit after that yeah okay yeah because we do want to dig back to the history and and, and see how um you know just uh, how long did it take for you uh, to come up with our rsvp well, i think well actually a couple months or a year yeah, once, once we called the, uh, the summit of the different, all these different people uh, sitting in a room, and we, done, we started um, mapping them out. And a person that I work with, uh, Lynn Kearney. Started, yeah, of course. Yeah, Lynn started making these drawings on the, yeah. on the board. And you started seeing all the different words that were being used, the similarities and all these things were going on. So you started just looking at the graphics she made and says, oh, Look, look at all the similarities we have. Right. I think that's important, too, is that you know, if we can make a picture of something, it almost leads us into coming up with some of our conclusions. You know, Gary Roman always says, the first thing I would try to do is try to make a picture of something that cleared up how he could see the world.
So that you bet, you bet. You have mentioned some great names, like uh, and also by the way, um, Lynn Kearney is also on my list to interview. She's a great uh, visual artist. Yeah, actually, and, uh, you know, uh, the book that I did with uh, was Lynn Kearney, Carol Hagen, and myself uh, who did that because when we came up with the idea, we wanted a lot of we wanted a lot of pictures. Thank you, <laughs> and and you know it's in Chinese also. I know, I know that. <laughs> so. Uh, so, you know, what we wanted to do is have all the illustrations because people kept asking us, you know, what are some of the models we should be using? And right. Some of the, uh, uh, you know, the visuals. And so Lynn was there to help us with, and she also with the writing of it too. She did a good job on writing some of the chat. Yeah, you bet. So you have mentioned some of the greatest and the names in the in the in the field. Uh, who who I mean, can you give us uh, you know who are the most influential on your career? Well, I'll give you some names of people you may have not have heard of. You bet. <laughs> and so, uh, but, I, but I think they influenced me. The first. Person, and also tell us what 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 kind of impact they they casted okay. on you. Okay, the, the first person that I want to say his name was Lloyd Hami. H-O-M-M-E. And Dr. Lloyd Hami had actually worked with B.F. Skinner uh, at the lab on performance improve or performance instruction. Uh, and he then he then left left that work and then moved to New Mexico. And that's where mm -hmm. I met him in New Mexico. And that's where I started working or was I mean I told you I was the one of the students that were testing perform pro program instruction. Right. So he, you know, I just sort of, I just kept learning stuff from him along the way. It's so sort of, I was a mentor. Uh, the next person at that same time was a person by the name of Don Toasty. T O. -S -S oh yeah, of course. Actually, a lot of people don't know, but Don Toasty is my brother. Really? Mm -hmm. Is your real brother? Is really my real brother? Yes. <laughs> really? Well, really? unfortunately, he 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 left us. Uh, uh, a few years ago, right? Yeah, Is that he, right? Yeah, he passed away about four years ago. Four years yeah. ago, right, right. Yeah, we had oh, you're a real brother. I never know that. Yeah, we, a lot of people don't know that. But anyway, <laughs> so, so. Your real brother. You, you, you know, when, when you say that, you do look alike. You do look alike. Yeah, you have the genes. I mean, wow. So, anyway, um, so, so, but again, I learned a lot from, yeah, actually. I do too. I did too. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of another funny story is people said, "How did you get the ISBI?" And this is uh -huh. sort of backwards. Is that my brother uh, was also working for Lloyd Honey, and there was a okay. conference. There was a conference going to be held, a program instruction in San Antonio, Texas. And so my brother said to his family, "Would you like to go to Texas to take a vacation?" And this was in 1962. <laughs> And so I said, sure, I'll go, I'll go with you and take a vacation. So I went, I can't say I went to the conference, but actually I went to the first conference in 1962 as part of my right. vacation. <laughs> ISPI was founded in 1962 and was in San Antonio. He so Don, both you and Don Tosti, your <laughs> brother, were right. the founding members of ISPI then. I, I can't say I was a founding member, but I was certainly there at the same time so you're the first one to attend the you're the first batch to attend the conference i mean you were there for the first conference i was there i, I probably didn't realize that what, what was happening at that time how many people then you know uh probably a few hundred maybe wow and the first i, I think i think i saw the first conference cost uh, i think it was like uh, less than a hundred dollars to attend the conference even the registration fee. Registration fee, right? <laughs> so, you know, in in 2015, and we go, we went back to ISPI conference was in San Antonio. It was that in 19, 2015 or 2016? Uh, I, I, uh, 15, I think. 15, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, in San Antonio, we were there. We were there, yeah. and, and a lot of people were talking about it. You know, at the higher hotel, higher regency, if you remember, you, you were there, right? Yeah, I was there. Yeah. And a lot of people were saying, "Oh, how can we get the old group to get together?" You know, something like that. And I was wondering, okay, 1962. Uh, let me jump onto a time machine to travel back and see what it happened. So you were actually there, right? Yeah, <laughs> I was there. Yes. <laughs> Great, great. I mean, uh, at another time, actually, I have another interview to do just on, on the first conference. 
I'm just go joking <laughs> because uh, we we I mean there are so many practitioners in PI and in learning development they that they they do need to hear something of uh, some of the very valuable histories and to see where this uh, industry evolved. So then another you know you had met other people along the way that had influence uh, a person by the name of George Geis and George Geis, oh yeah of course and George Geis was one of the um, you know he worked with Yuri Rumler. And so I learned a lot from him around uh, and, and a lot of a lot of things instructional wise. He he was he was a wonderful presenter. I mean his his knowledge was just vast. And he worked with Gary Rumler. And so Gary Rumler Gary Rumler was another uh, important uh, figure um, in my development. Uh, Joe Harless, uh, his models on Joe Harless. Uh, certainly Bob Mager. Uh, I learned a lot from Bob Mager. Um, Margot Murray, learned a lot from Margot Murray. Uh, Allison Rossett is another person along the way uh, that you know, always has good sound uh, work. Uh, so Harold Stolovich, Harold Stolovich's work is just you know just wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm probably missing lots of people out there, but those are people that come off the top of my head that uh, made a difference in what I what I did. You bet. You bet. Uh, all the last three or four people that are on my list too. Good. Uh, uh, Alison wrote Rosette, Margot, Margo, Murray, and Harold, and right. also his wife uh, Erica Keeps. Erica. Now, well, Erica. You no, know, Erica is a really good practitioner of performance mm -hmm. improvement, uh, and uh, so so she's a good one. Yeah, she's a good one to interview too. I may have them both on the screen uh, just uh, to see them uh, chatting. I think actually I think that'd be fun to have both of them together. Yes. You bet, they're, they're a great pair, the yeah. great pair. We had a fun in 2017 uh, when we were in the conference in ah, Montreal, if you remember, we were in Montreal, yes. Well, oh, by the way, another person who is more contemporary, who I think is one of the best thinkers we have around, is uh, Klaus Wittgen. And Klaus is, is his model. Oh, yeah, of course. His models are quite, quite good. So I recommend, you know, Put him on your list also to interview because he's you know again he's one of my actually I've worked with him for many years as well. Yes, yes, yes. Klaus is also on top of my list and I contacted him like two weeks ago and he's holding up a right. Everybody's staying home right now, you know. <laughs> I know. I, I talk to him or send him a mail most every day just to see how he's doing. You bet. You bet. You're a great pal. <laughs> You're great pals. Okay. Uh, so you have done, uh, sir. You have done a lot of lot of um, consulting projects, and a lot of them are in PI. And a lot of names you mentioned, that like you have the students, uh, you know, B.F. Skinner, the great thinker, um, as your teacher, and your your brother, of course, influenced you. I just wonder, earlier you're at the earlier stage of your career. Was there any chances that opportunities that you had a flash idea that you're not going to be in PI, but you're going to devote yourself in learning development specifically? And then you did, and then you decide you didn't. I can't say that learning is not one of the interventions. So mm -hmm. along, I mean, it's always part of what I've done. So I can't say that I don't do that. It just not, it's just not my, it's not my focal point. But I'm saying, so, but again, often what you found out is that, you know, if, if, if it was one of the interventions that was called for, then of course I would recommend it. So it just, right. with, but also the other thing too, is that also I could find people in the field that were much better at it than I was. So I would hire them <laughs> to, to do the, to, to do the learning modules. So anyway, that's, the reason I'm asking is that because uh, a lot of them, I, I, by, uh, by a lot, I mean millions of uh, learning development uh, professionals here in China and other developing countries, uh, they're facing career choice, choices. You know, right now, PI is there. I mean, you know, with, uh, with the internet, everybody knows what PI is, performance improvement is, and, and, but they're still at the training job, you know, and they're at the stage of uh, upgrading, upgrading themselves from learning development to a wider scope of performance improvement or business improvement or result improvement or efficiency, everything, but basically results, business results and nothing but results. So 
so they're 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 kind of a uh, you know watching and 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 to do what they should. So they're they're perplexed and they probably haven't made up their mind is made made up their mind yet. But what you just gave us an example is your career story, your real story that you look at train learning development as one of the one, only one of the many interventions among I mean among all the. Performance interventions. Well, okay. One of the things, and I think you asked me this on another question, is that right. one of the things that is important to me is what we call the four W's. Okay. The, the first W is uh, the worker. So, and that's when you see maybe training being an appropriate solution to a, or, or, or learning intervention. Um, but often, Often I said, if that, that's only one, one little piece of the puzzle, and this is a big puzzle, one piece of the bubble, puzzle is that they have to do some type of work. So that's the second W, or the processes. So the processes have to be able, people have to be able to do them. And sometimes the processes are not easy to do in organizations. So you have to have a good pro. And that's where I, I learned that a lot of, from that work from uh, Gary Rummler. Gary Rummler, I think, was one of the best process people around. And then the, the, the next, and, and also, you know, also learned from him, was that you've got to have some context uh, in the workplace and to make a difference to the workplace or the enterprise. And so the workplace became the, the, the third W. So, so that's what I'm thinking as a performance improvement consultant. You've got to look at the worker, the work, and the workplace. And then finally, you know, uh, working on the, uh, uh, from the work of uh, Roger Kaufman, when he talked about mega, I said, well, it's got to probably have some type of impact. And that's when we added world to this. So our analysis became, you know, first of all, what we're doing has any impact on the world, what we're actually doing. And if we can, if we can really look at a bigger picture and say that, then I think we can make a difference in, in what we're trying to do to our planet. So that's just what I'm, how I'm looking at the, at the performance consulting today. So I, again, I, my advice would, would be, you know, if you're an instructional designer or whatever, try to at least have a big, big picture of what you're trying to accomplish in your instruction. You're trying to accomplish people doing the work, the processes, where they do the work, that's the workplace. And then is there anything that you actually can have impact in the world? And again, I think if you also look at what's happening today with this pandemic, we're all connected. Right. <laughs> Whether we like it or not, we're all connected. So we all trying to make some type of impact. And so you can see what happens in one part of the world has a very, very uh, impact to other parts of the world. So we're not, I don't think we're safe. I never have thought that by the way. I think we've always Yeah, that was my question that I'm going to ask you that uh, from uh, three, we changed from a three W to four W. Uh, right. I asked the question was because that when I was at, you know, school doing my degree in master's degree in instructional design and performance improvement, I was, I, I was taught like by my, um, 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 by my uh, uh, professor, uh, Chris LaCroix, she, she retired right now. And uh, she told us the three W's, the work, the worker, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the work, the worker, and the workplace. Right. So, and then uh, when did it become four W's and added the world? Who, who did that? I, I added the fourth W. You the, did, did. The, the, yeah. So, uh, and that because just I started doing, you know, more, actually I started doing more work with Roger Kaufman. And mega, mega was, to me, it's a, it's a hard word for people to understand. So I said, well, if we just talk about the fourth W of the world, so impact to the world. So that's how it got started. So Roger and I, actually, we just did an article together uh, on the pandemic issues around the, the, the mega world aspects of it. We just published an ISPI. Of course, there are a lot of similarities between MEGA and the world. Right. So there are a lot of ties. In, there are a lot of things in common. They tie right. together. Right. They all try to, you know, look at the macro environment. So, but what are the differences? 
I, I, Even minute differences. I, I think the only difference is, is what he calls, he calls it mega and I call it world. <laughs> but all the tools, are, are, are you guys, the tools are, are the same or? Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty much the same. I think he, has his, same. Yeah. he has his own models, but I mean, if you look at them, uh, all the, the, most of the models have similarities. And guess what? The similarities are RSVP. You bet. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> he, focuses, he focuses on results. He, he thinks about systems. Actually, I read, I just, I just found his first book he ever wrote, and it was, it was basically around systems. So, so that's kind of funny. Right, right. He, he published like 39 books or something like that. Oh, he did. He's published a lot of books, yes. <laughs> yes, a lot of them. And then 300 articles, something like that. And still counting. So... I know. No, what was interesting is that I, uh, I do a, a quarterly uh, articles with an organization called Business Process Trends, BP Trends. And uh, Carol Haig and I have been doing these articles. And I, so I said, well, I wonder how many articles I did with just BP Trends. And we pulled up all the articles. And if you go to their website, there's over 40 articles that she and I have done on that website. And then there's another website which is HPT Treasure. And I said, I wonder how many articles I have on HPT Treasure. And Carol and I had done over 100 articles and interviews on that one. So I said, these things add up pretty quickly about how many articles and uh, books and things like you've done. So I've done, I can't say as many as Roger has, but certainly they, they do accumulate very quickly. That's still, I still want to use the word model <laughs> that right. we mentioned earlier. That's all right. My, 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 it's a good word. It's a good word. It's a, it is. It is. It is uh, something that we really look look up to. I mean, uh, you in your during a, your long career, and then it's accumulative. And of course, you have contributed many article articles and wisdoms and intelligence to there's all a, of there, us and professional for our there's, there's for our that, professional development. There's the things you have to remember about models is that all models are useful, and all models are wrong. They're all relative. They're all, yeah, because, yes, because you know, relativity. They, they all have a context, so they all can be useful. But guess what? They can have their flaws also. You bet. You yeah. bet. That's a that's a great warning. That's a great warning. And thank you for thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's really applicable to all of our viewers as well because. In in China, you know, in China and the developing other developing countries, we're growing very fast and trying. We're very, we're wearing, trying very hard. You know, try and get something fast and easy, and, and try to try to grasp and you know something tangible, something applicable, and they and we want results overnight. So and and then we rely on models a lot heavily. And again, I think you know the difference between somebody new to the field they'll find a model or they'll find a something that they like and that's what they that's what they use over and over and over again but right. actually as the more you get experience you find out some of those some of those models just don't work and that's when you start becoming an expert so you've got to really look at uh, how to use different approaches in the right context Exactly, exactly. All models should, I, I absolutely agree with you, all the models should work. I, that reminds me one of the, you know, famous uh, lines, uh, it's, a, it's a Honda, Honda auto parts, it's like, you know, dominoes, Honda hearts, you know, they, they do the dominoes like uh, 59 seconds. And at the very end, uh, the good old uh, Garrison Keeler came in, was came in. Wouldn't it be nice if, when, uh, wouldn't it be nice when something just work. <laughs> I know, I go back to what I think. Excuse me. I go back to what I said. You know, it's like, I wish online weren't learning just worked. <laughs> you bet, you bet. Right. And, and I, I think that's everybody's wish. Right. So um, you have been doing, uh, Roger, you have done a lot of consulting projects. What do you see are the challenges are for PI consulting projects, the performance improvement consulting projects? Well, I think from my perspective is that when you go in on a consulting project, often the person who brought you in has a solution to what the problem was. 
and they want you to verify what they thought it was. And it's really, really sometimes very difficult to say, well, can we just step back and let me, let me do some observations before we come up to any conclusions? And that's always the hard thing because people want, people want a quick fix. You really have to have the guts to say that, right? It took me a while. Yes, I, didn't, I certainly didn't do that when I first started. You bet, you bet. But, but again, uh, I just say, you know, that's what you brought me in for. And I'm going to try to give you, at least from my perspective, what, how I see the, um, what the issues are. You bet. That's one challenge. That, uh, do, you, do you see any other challenges that are common? Like, what do you have summed up with RSVP? Or what are the common challenges that when you do well, a PI I mean, project? It's, it's not necessarily a challenge. But mm -hmm. then it, I work with different in industries. One you of the bet. things you've got to do before you go work in the industry is find out about them and use their language as quickly as possible. So you basically don't use our language when you you're with, with an organization, you try. So if you're in the financial organization, you try to use financial or words. If you're in um, the computer industry, you try to use computer. If you're in the medical, actually, one of the industries that works very quick, easily for us is the medical industry. Because performance improvement is a diagnostic, prescriptive approach. And that's how they talk. And basically, we are science driven. So are they. So, um, you know, there's some nice little um, pictorials about what doctors do and what performance, and performance consultants do. And actually, they're very similar. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really coincides to the, to the good uh, old proverb, all roads lead to Rome. <laughs> So, uh, uh, still something hanging around. Uh, uh, just one last question on the on being a consulting uh, uh, leader. So, what do you think does it take? What What does it take in your mind, uh, in your in your opinion, to make a good performance consultant? First of all, do your homework before you go in and talk to your client, and then. Focus on your client and their customer. Because what you want to do is go to the next level up. You know, you know what, what, why were you brought in in the first place? What's the business issue that's getting in the way of them performing or being at their, at their peak performance? So you're trying to look at how can you have impact on not only their, them, but also their customer. So if you think, then, then if you really want to get big on it, how does that affect the world? <laughs> Here you go. Right. <laughs> it comes around. <laughs> right, it comes around, right. You bet. That's, that's a great advice. When you said uh, do your homework, by homework, do you mean you just mentioned the, to speak their language and know their, maybe know their line profession or know their occupation? Well, what do you, can you elaborate a little bit more? I don't, I don't think you necessarily have to know their occupation, but you have to know the company that has brought you in. You need to know something about, about them. And so the first thing I always try to do is go to the website of that organization and try to read as much as I can about you know, who they are. And most of the time, also, they have a history page. You bet. I always go to the history page because I, I always find out a lot of things about the organization on their history. So I go to the and they're history. and they're above us, about us, right? About okay. us. Right. So I look at their their corporate structure. I look at their mission and visions and value statements that are usually there. I try to go back and look at the history of the organization. Uh, mm -hmm. Just you know, just some. If they, I love to have when they have pictures. Uh, you bet. About their organization. Um, the. And there's some, there's, some, there's some great websites out there. So I think that's the first thing I do. And then the next thing I do is I try to find out, uh, you know, are there any, um, if you go on there, if they sell stock on the stock exchange, uh, and then, I know a lot of places don't, but I try to go to the stock exchange and see what articles have been written about them or, or are they written about themselves? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just just as, and again, you know, I'm not saying that's going to take a long time. 
it may be, you know, it's maybe an afternoon's work, but it's, like, it's just enough to, so you don't go in there blind. You bet. You bet. So we just, uh, we just mentioned that, um, <laughs> performance architect. So tell us something about this book and what's your major point uh, in this book and why, what, why did you write this book with, with uh, Kara Haig and Lynn Kearney? Well, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd worked with Lynn and Carol for many, many years. And uh, we, have been, we, we talked about, uh, we talked about what we had, we need some tools and resources so mm -hmm. people can use at different levels. So then, therefore, we decided to break the book up into um, the work worker in the workplace and the models and tools that go with those three levels. So that's how it came about. Now, performance architecture, architecture is a, a word that I coined with another person. Um, and this goes back to the 1980s. Um, I, had, I was introduced to a, a man, his name is Mark Johnson. And Mark Johnson is an architect. And we started comparing some of the work that he does or did and some of the work that I was doing. <laughs> Excuse me. Take your time. And when we started looking at the models and started looking at the work he was doing and coming up with what he does and what I do, it became very apparent they're very similar. So he was the architect of performance architecture, and I was the performance side. So that's when we start bringing those two models together. And we've been working ever every since uh, on different projects and different, and different things. So that's how performance and architecture came about. And the point, we, mm -hmm. the point that Carol and Lynn and I wanted to make was that could we do something that helped people look at tools and resources on those three levels? We didn't touch the fourth level. Now, we've, we've written articles about it since then, but we didn't touch the fourth level because of the size of the book. I mean, we had, was always, a, publishers always give you limitations, unfortunately. But that's how it came about. And then the other thing, too, is that we wanted to leave people with something easy, and we wanted to have a lot of pictures. So what was nice about it, we spent two days with Gary Rump, go back to Gary, we spent two days with Gary Rumler, and he basically opened up his whole library to us. And that's wow. How, you know, that was that was really great. And which year was that? Well, go look. What was the what was the year the, the book came out? I always forget what the year the book came out. And so it was like uh, it was, it was early. You like, probably have written a lot of books, and uh, this is <laughs> this is just one of them. I was say that's that's a, the latest one. Um, I can't remember what year it came out. It should be right in the front. I think this is a newer edition. Yeah. Newer edition. Right. But it, but you know, was it was it about a year before? Two thousand eight. Okay. Two thousand nine. So probably probably two thousand seven. Is that when we went to visit him, or maybe before. right? Right. And Gary passed away in night uh, in twenty. 10 probably 11 2011 yeah, yeah maybe yeah. around that time yeah because i literally cried on my desk oh yeah oh. i was i was and i was uh i was in uh in ireland i was on a at a conference in ireland when i heard about it mm -hmm. all right anyway great mind great mastermind um actually that, uh, actually it was interesting about that is that uh, Carol Haig and I are coming out with an article that's just now being published in Performance Express. And what we're, what we're doing is going back and looking at some of his early work and some of his early videos. So uh, I, I'll send you the link to that when it's, when it's published. I think you'll enjoy, you enjoy looking at it because we, we talk, it's got a lot of links to his uh, videos that he did in the 1960s and uh, 70s. You bet. Any any uh, work or research or interesting project you're working on right now? Something new that uh, coming out of his way, and you can tell us or preview or um, or yeah. thirty seconds trailer. I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. What the, the problem is right now is that because um, I've been shut in for three months. <laughs> it's it's even sometimes hard to think about it. 
but again, I've been, I've been, I'm interested in, again, I just finished that article with Roger, that he was kind enough to uh, work with him on that. But some, right. but something that I'm thinking about world impact is, um, you know, cause I think right now we see that has something to do with what we're trying to accomplish. Right. Yeah. That that's really a, ne- a next question. Uh, really, uh, kind of a leads into the next question is uh, how does the pandemic, current pandemic, change the PI field or consulting business? Well, I th- and I, and I thought that was not only financial. I mean, but comprehensively. Well, interesting question too, because I mentioned earlier one of our one of the things that make us have value to the organization is that we can do observation. And right now, it's very, very difficult to do any observation in the organizations. Uh, so, yeah. I think so. Right now, it's going to be, from my perspective, that would be a very, very difficult thing to do. Right. Um, but it is next, even uh, next to impossible, or even, even just absolutely impossible right now to do the uh, side-by-side observations. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So I think that was one of the things. There are, I think that, that's... I think that's the main thing right now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Make, it, make, it, make, it, make it challenging. You bet, you bet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, there's, but there's still some interesting things going on. I know uh, people are, I, I still get emails from people working on performance improvement projects around right. the world. And so uh, there's, some, again, some challenges, but people are, are, are they're getting ready. So when this starts opening up a little bit, they'll be ready to go with some, uh, some of the, things there's going to be a, a good conference online conference i hope uh in september it's the emea conference uh that's the performance improvement conference that focuses on the uh, uh more the you mean last year or the coming the coming one this one it'll be, it'll okay. be online it'll be online I it's be online to, too talk to mm-hmm. uh, um carol panza about it and she, they're getting ready to put it online they already have a a case study worked out, and it's going to come from South Africa. I talked to Billy Nell, and Billy is coming up with one of her clients to be part of the case study. So I think it'll be interesting to see what they can do around. And then I think that um, you know we, I may do a session with them also. So that would be one maybe to look for. You know, Billy uh, has just awarded the uh, Distinguished Service Award, right? Yes, she did. Yep. Good for her, and she's still on my list. Right. Good. So, yeah, yeah, that's uh, um, so right right now we have so many learning and development, you know, learning development uh, for professionals, and they have heard PI, and they're now uh, moving into performance improvement. But you know, you have been into developing countries, and you have been to China, and you have seen a lot. So. Is, is there any difference when you give advice to the uh, learning development professionals uh, who are ready to move into PI in, in, in the United States or in the Western world or to those who are in the development countries? Well, I think this, I, I, I don't know if this thing sounds strange, but I think in developing countries, you have an advantage. What advantage? I think you have an advantage is that you can basically there's a lot, of, a lot of resources out there that didn't exist when I first started. And so I would say take advantages of the resources that exist in performance improvement and seeing how it can apply to your organizations. And understand, again, going back, if you've got a performance issue in the organization, try to solve it from a standpoint as it's not the worker, it's probably the system. And if you can look at it from that standpoint, you can have more value to your organization. And again, I think from a developing country is yes, we need to get the skills and knowledge into the culture, into the organizations. And we, you have a great opportunity to say, how are we going to solve some of these bigger issues that are out there just beside more than just skills and knowledge acquisition, skills and knowledge so that, that's a, that, at least that's what I. So I mean, it's it, the opportunities are much bigger, I think, that developing countries have than. Basically, sometimes we get stuck in our own ways. 
So you said three times that uh, that the uh, it is probably not the people. The people are ready there, but it's a, it's a system that not working in. It's kind of a it's a as a general warning or general starting place yeah. and starting point. And uh, why do you think that way? I mean, is is that the conclusion that you have? I mean, you draw from many many. Just it's something that I've seen. Cases? Something that I've seen over and over and over. It's you know people people work in systems, right? And if you work in systems, if you and your system is not, it's it's not working together, mm -hmm. working in silos, right? Then uh, then I think you have the problem. And I think you know Gary Rumler, uh, going back to Gary's work, you know one of the things that he discovers managing the white space. Right, that great book, yeah. And, and so it's, you know, that sort of tells it all, is that if you work in silos, m my, my output is your input. And if I don't give you good input, you can't do your job. Right. If my system doesn't work and I pass it on to you, you can't do your work. So we all work in a system. Okay. Is, that, is that partial, is that also part, one of the reasons that you don't call HPT, but you prefer more performance improvement because you try to avoid the human side and you think that it's, it's, it's more than a human side, right? I look at, because you know, again, I go back and look at, there are people doing right. work in an environment. And all, that, all that's got to work together. It's a system. <laughs> and all it's gonna yes, it, it's, it's a mega. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> it's amazing. And again, uh, uh, you know, Klaus uh, and I've got a, a nice little model that can, another model, <laughs> but basically can map out that whole thing very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then, right. then, no, no, forget, is that I work in a system, and right. then my, my manager also works in a system. And his mm -hmm. manager or her manager works on a system. Mm -hmm. So all those have to work together. Right. You have also been uh, considered, you are also, um, I mean, after all this long career, you are yourself also considered one of the legends of the uh, PI industry and um, worldwide, actually. So looking back, if you had a chance to do it all over again, what would you do differently? That's a hard question. I, I hope not. But... No, it's a hard question. No, I, uh, one of fun things, question. Yeah, one, it's a fun question. One of the things that I wish that I had done earlier was uh, to step back and, and, and look at the whole organization and not – sometimes when you work inside an organization, you try to please your boss. You bet. And, 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 and that's the hard part. And so you really got to say, okay, it's almost like a yes, yes, I need, or yes, it'd be good to please your boss and do the right thing. And sometimes doing the right thing is not necessarily pleasing your boss. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, as an outside consultant, that's easier to do, but, I know, but I've, been, I've been inside an organization and I've been outside an organization. And um, it's... Uh, I, that's one of the things I wish I'd done earlier in my career, especially working inside, is saying, you know, just sitting down with the people that I work with closely and say, well, wait a minute, let's, let's discover this together and come up with solutions that's going to make sense to the organization. Yeah. But you just said that uh, uh, when, when, you asked, when you started in the, in the 70s and 60s and then there wasn't any... I mean, big giant figure there like yourself to us today, and then we can look up to, we can follow the models or the, you know, the methodologies and RSVPs and principles. But at that time, you didn't have a lot. But today, today's world, in 2020, there's, I mean, millions of practitioners, they do, right? That's... Yeah, yeah there, you have a, there's a lot, more, a lot more resources. Right. That when we started, I had, you know, there were a few people, that, you know, there, were, there, were, there were articles being written, there are workshops you go to, but there wasn't a, it wasn't a whole it wasn't a whole lot. I mean, there's lots of books, there's lots of resources out there. Just go find them. And go back to go go look at the HPT Treasure website. 
that's got a lot of resources on it. I mean, it's just full of resources. You bet, you bet. So when they got the same challenges, like what you guys 50 years ago, half a century ago, like you have to do the job, right? And then you have to please your boss. I mean, unfortunately, I, th unfortunately, I, I, I assume, and this is probably for, is still true today, that it's still a very common phenomenon or challenges are, I mean, the, the, the L&D professionals are facing today in their daily jobs. And, but right now they have different resources. I mean, they have a lot of re resources, right? Mm -hmm. That's the point I think you make. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, a lot, there's just a lot of more resources out there. You bet. The thing, but don't forget, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of resources that are not scientific or have a science background too. They're fads. Right, right. So don't, don't get trapped into the next fad. Um, you know, make sure that you go to, you know, challenge yourself, what's, what's the research behind some of the work and so i think that's important to do right um we're, we're getting close to to our to very our easy talk. jeffrey but we, we 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 did last a lot of good questions i mean that's the question that i had and all of our viewers had that and one thing that i want to you know come out of the interview that i want to thank you on behalf of me and and myself and and, and ding hui and, and hui ding or in, Chinese, in english way that when we met in warsaw in Warsaw, right? Right, right? And uh, that was in 2014, 2014 in the, at the EMEA conference. And you gave us, you and Klaus were there, and then you gave us the advice to change from processor, processing factors to drivers. Right. And uh, that, was a, that, that was a hit to our model. And uh, we, 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 we kept uh, working on that, you know. I think one of the things that uh, I think you always have to think about doing is making words uh, that that have some type of meaning for your clients. You bet. And I, I think going back to, I remember that going to your session, I said to class, I said, those guys got something good. <laughs> go, go, listen Thank to you. Find out, yeah, go listen to what they've got, find out what they've got. So I think that you all have a, you know, a good model that, uh, good model. But again, don't forget, all models are good, but all models are flawed. <laughs> So, so context. context. I got that. Yeah. We're, we're we're trying to beat you in, in that aspect. <laughs> good, good. Okay. good. My uh, just uh, Roger. Uh, well, just a little bit of, of preview that uh, our English book is coming out this year. So, because it's already uh, it developed a lot, way more mm -hmm. than that we presented in night back in twenty fourteen. So, good, good. I'm looking forward to seeing it. You bet. You bet. You will have a copy too. Okay. And first of the one of the first copies. Uh, last question: uh, Do you have any closing comment to our viewers, millions of viewers? And do you have anything that uh, you want to say, or you want to comment, or you want to remind, or as advice, or suggestion, or anything that you want to say no, to I, the young practitioners? I think I think education is important. I think the idea of reading about our profession is important, and then questioning uh, do these things make sense and then also do they make sense in my culture sometimes uh, performance improvement models and words and uh, uh, context don't make sense in other cultures so you got to adapt it to your own environment to your own culture that's just how i think and even to even to the word performance improvement uh, sometimes that doesn't even translate into various languages and you've got to translate into something that makes sense. And I, I, in my last story is I remember, um, actually it was in Taiwan, I was giving a, uh, a presentation and that my uh, lecture was going to be um, interpreted in Chinese. So I sat down with my interpreter and uh, I was telling him, he was reading over my text, and um, I, I came up with the, or I was talking about the Pygmalion effect. Are you familiar with the Pygmalion effect is? So the Pygmalion effect, and he said, well, he said what's that? And I, so I started, started talking to him about it. He says, oh, don't worry. Um, we have a story just like that in Chinese. So it's a matter of you've got to interpret it into your own languages. And I think one of the things that I think that you've done uh, good at it 
is that you try to basically adapt the models to a Chinese culture. I think that's one thing that I think is important. Again, and Belia has worked in South Africa. And one of the things I learned a long time ago as a consultant going into different countries, I will always have to have somebody in that country that will work with me because I am an outsider coming into Europe. So I'm a performance consultant tourist. And I need somebody who understands the culture so we can get things done. So that, that's just my, my parting advice is just as, you know, if, if you were coming to work in the United States, is that you would have a partner here in the United States that would help understand the nuances in the culture of the U.S. Even though you lived here, it, it's, you, know, you know there's differences. Yep, I do. Right. Yep, yep. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Can I ask just one last question? Sure. Why, you're, why Don and you have the different last names? And- because my uh, brothers, um, we have the same mother. And my brother's um, father died when he was very young. And then my, um, my mother remarried. So that's why. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a personal fact, but as a human, we want a human touch from a, from a, from a training master. So that's why I'm asking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for thinking of me. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And um, thank you. And we wish you very well. And we wish you well. And stay safe, please, sir. Stay safe. I'm staying safe. I'm staying inside. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Okay. Talk to you later. Okay. See you later.